In the last segment, we considered the multiple symbolic roots of human evil. In this segment, we'll consider the multiple symbolic roots of human goodness and also the ways that we can overcome human tendencies to succumb to evil. If symbolic cognition affords humans the possibility of being and doing evil, it also affords them the possibility of being and doing good. Just as there are many ways to harm a mind or that which it cares about, there are many ways to benefit a mind or that which it cares about. Most of the ways of being or accomplishing good are the opposite of the ways of being or accomplishing evil. One can be good by being kind, just as one can be evil by being unkind, the extreme of which is sadism. By its very nature, kindness occurs best when one is not tokenizing the recipient of one's kindness, since only then can one tailor one's kind acts to the particular needs of an individual. Indeed, only if one is attending to the changing needs of the recipient of one's goodness can one continually tailor one's actions to those changing needs. It requires internal modeling of the mind of the recipient. Kindness is therefore not even possible for animals because they lack a theory of mind. Animals can be affectionate, but they can't be kind. It thus appears that doing and being good requires the cultivation of a certain kind of mentality, not just a certain kind of behavior, since good behaviors follow from the mentality and less so vice versa. This mentality is one that is kind and compassionate rather than cruel, attentive rather than inattentive, and focused on the individual rather than on the class or the token. Just as evil can emerge in the symbolic realization of desires and urges that we have in common with animals, typically centered on aggression, dominance, territoriality, and sex, good can emerge in the symbolic realization of other desires and urges that we also have in common with animals and which are not themselves symbolic. Among these would be urges and desires for affection, love, community, compassion, nurturing, protecting, parenting, commitment, and bonding. However, it would be simplistic to say that evil emerges from the symbolic enactment of one set of desires and good emerges from another mutually exclusive set. In fact, good or evil can arise from the symbolic enactment of any one of these urges and desires. For example, overprotectiveness can harm the recipients of this excess of love by making them dependent and weak. A lack of aggression can lead to harm as one fails to protect oneself or others whom one loves. Thus, affection can be expressed in an immoral way, and aggression can be expressed in a moral way. Morality should therefore not be equated with the enactment of pro-social desires. Immorality should not be confused with the enactment of destructive or base desires. Morality is not so simple. All evil and all good derive from the fact that our minds are symbolic. Even though being symbolic has cursed us with so much past and present evil and so much potential for more evil, being symbolic has blessed us with the ability to choose what is right and good. Our symbolic mind equips us to actively fight those possessed of evil mentalities. The only salvation from human evil lies in human goodness. No one will rescue us from our own minds. There's hope for us because human minds can be changed. Humans absorb and create culture and can be taught to act and think differently than they now do. This is especially true of children. However, you can't force a change in mentality by threatening, coercing, or killing people. You can change behavior with violence or the threat of violence, but this lasts only as long as the threat is in place. A change in mentality with its consequent changes in behavior is enduring and only emerges as one symbol structure comes to replace another in a person's mind. The tried and true ways to accomplish such a mental shift are education, persuasion, and inculcation. Mentalities can change for the better in more than just incremental ways if the correct approach is taken. The only mind that we have complete access to is our own. It's here that there's the greatest hope of a transformation, but it takes a great deal of effort. In an earlier segment, we considered the benefits and dangers of automatization. Operating in zombie mode, say when driving, saves mental resources and allows us to act quickly and efficiently, but it also comes at the cost of flexibility and being observant of the particularities of any given situation. When something unexpected happens, we revert to fully attentive mode and can consider options in a slow and deliberative but conscious and flexible way. 
But when we operate in zombie mode with regard to other people, we operate using schemas and stereotypes. We tokenize other people and fail to see them as the individual person they really are. If our schemas are full of biases, then our behavior toward the people we deal with will also be biased. Beyond merely stopping undesirable behaviors, one way to confront the sources of human evil known as racism, sexism, ageism, and so on, is to de-tokenize people in the minds of the people who tokenize them. This is more easily said than done, but it can be done. It requires a change of mind and heart. It seems that the human brain tends to minimize effort whenever possible by dealing with people, objects, and events at the level of tokens of pre-existing categories or symbols that stand for pre-existing concepts. For example, the upshot of many recent experiments involving change blindness is that people do not notice that a person has been replaced by another person unless that person switches categories, especially the categories of gender, race, and age, and unless they paid attention to the person and encoded their individual characteristics rather than just encoding them as the instance or token of a pre-existing category. Great spiritual leaders of the past have warned against operating within this zombie-like state of tokenization, in part because it can lead to acts of stupidity and evil. They have emphasized the need to transform one's mind by cultivating compassion and love for individuals and by paying attention to the particularities of events. Why does the brain tokenize? Minimization of effort is part of the explanation, but not all of it. There may be parts of the brain, such as certain nuclei of the amygdala, that are designed to operate at a level of tokenization in order to rapidly detect imminent threats. This brain structure may have a high rate of false alarms, but it exists because it's better to make a false alarm for certain kinds of threat than it is to make an incorrect rejection, which can result in being eaten or otherwise killed. For example, it would be unwise to have a brain that ponders the individuality of each individual tiger. If we said, well, I know most tigers are man-eaters, but I shouldn't generalize because maybe this one isn't. Well, the genes that led to this kind of thought process would get weeded out quickly since that individual would quite likely get eaten. So evolution has led to us having brains that tokenize, particularly regarding potentially dangerous things. Indeed, it's probable that the amygdala is hardwired to carry out certain kinds of stereotyping and certain types of stereotypical false alarms. This is why people across cultures tend to mistakenly see people, snakes and spiders, in their peripheral vision when it was in fact just the bush, stick, or blowing leaf. It's also why people rarely experience a false alarm on things that could not be an imminent threat. It would be a strange mind, indeed, that often mistakenly saw a distant mountain range or a constellation out of the corner of one's eye. There are still other reasons why the brain tokenizes. We're taught to tokenize. We mimic and learn from those around us, and if they're operating at this level, we will probably learn to do so also, unless we are especially sensitive individuals. Another reason appears to be that tokenization and stereotyping allow us to ignore a great deal of irrelevant detail. As such, tokenization is probably a necessary cognitive strategy to avoid sensory and attentional overload. In the next section, we'll consider how human goodness can be cultivated both through individual practices and through a transformation of the cultural scaffolding that goes into the construction and support of our minds.